How's it going, everyone? Today we're going to talk about self-control. When I think about self-control, uh, I think the thing that first comes to mind is a dog. And why I think of a dog is I think of a dog, and while the dog's sitting there, you know, you tell him to sit, and you take out that milk bone treat, and you set it right on top of his snout. And the dog just sits there with it on his snout. He's not moving. He's looking at it. The, the milk bone is within his vision. You can smell it. His mouth is probably watering. He wants to eat that thing. But a dog with good self-control, a dog that has been trained to have self-control, will withhold from himself what he desires. He desires to partake of the milk bone, and yet he does not. And the reason he does not is because he is of his training. You think about children, for example. If you leave children in a room and you tell them, you know, don't touch something, don't do it, or don't do this, or whatever, and then you leave, what happens? Well, if they're anything like the children that I know, then they will eventually touch that thing or they will do the thing that they were told not to do. Whether it's they forget or whatever, most often than not, it's the self-control issue. It's like trying to tell someone, you know, not to touch the big red button. It's difficult. It's a temptation. They want to do it. And you have to watch your children as a parent. Why can't you just leave them? Because they don't have the self-control to take care of themselves. That's why you are doing it. Webster defines self-control as restraint exercised over one's own impulses, emotions, or desires. And I love that last one, desires. Because people who practice self-control, they, they have restraint over their own impulses. They don't require a parent, a teacher, a, an armed you know, officer or guard or any government official to make them behave. They just can do it themselves. They can control themselves properly. They maybe do it for moral or spiritual reasons, and they've chosen to follow this path. These people who have self-control are skilled in the art of self-denial, delayed gratification, and respect for others. But when we think about self-control, it's more than just those wonderful qualities that we can spit out. It's actually a godly quality, a biblical quality. And yet the world does not really seem to like it that much. We live in a world of comfort and self-gratification, one where the individual pleasure can trump over any other type of thing. I want to do this, therefore I should be able to. There's no restraint in the acts of, of anything that we want to do. It would seem just do what makes you feel good. But we ought to be better than that. The Bible uses a lot of words to describe self-control. Some of the older ones use words like temperance and sober, which, you know, we understand that those are not exactly self-control, but they do have the underlying pinings of self-control. Sober-minded is another one. You'll see that used in Titus chapter 2 and verse 6, or discreet even in some even older ones in verse 5. But when we think about this idea of self-control being used, each of these words, as the Bible uses them, has an underlining idea of self-sovereignty, this idea that you rule yourself. I control myself. Nothing controls me. And that's at the heart of this concept that we believe of free will. The idea that you have the ability to make decisions. You have the ability to make controlled choices. And because of that, you have responsibility. That means that the choices that you do will have, you know, reactions by, of God by them. I think the way that we probably have heard this said in the scriptures often is you reap what you sow. Frequently, that is used throughout the scriptures or the concept thereof, but probably I think the verse that puts it the easiest to understand actually comes from Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 specifically, in which it reads, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, and he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. This concept of self-responsibility is at the heart of our doctrinal beliefs, especially that of the final judgment and our standing with God. Our relationship with God is, is built upon everything there. Jesus himself and nearly every single teaching that he puts out on the individual, he puts a responsibility for them to control themselves. 
whether it's to do something or avoid something, whatever it may be. Many of the parables directly teach this, whether you're going to choose to be a good servant or a wicked servant, be ready and waiting or slothful and ill-prepared, walk this path, not that path. All of those require you to choose, which means you control which way your feet will go. Are you going to take the path to the left or the path to the right? It's up to you. Now, we can respond to this in many different ways. And not responding, by the way, is still a response. But how will we answer the call of temptation? Or how we will decide to overcome our natural urges to do the opposite that which we know is good, to be more like Christ. That's at the heart of the daily battle of the Christian because we recognize that the way that we were living is not acceptable. The way we are kind of taught to live or the way that the world wants you to live is just to do what makes you feel good, like we said earlier. You want to eat that? Eat that. You want to, you know, taste that, taste that. You want to do this activity, do this activity. Paul dealt strongly with it. He talked about it in the book of Romans, for example, this idea that, you know, he even faltered from time to time. And what he was talking about in Romans chapter 7 actually was this concept of the law versus grace. And the law versus grace argument is a beautiful argument that Paul makes there. He says that he falls and that you're going to fall and that everybody falls and we need to rely on God's grace, but we don't need to abuse it. It's not an example of saying, okay, we can just do whatever we want and get God's forgiveness later. He dealt with that in actually chapter 6. But in chapter 7, he's arguing against the law of supremacy in the view of God's grace and Christ's sacrifice. That being said, I want you to listen to this and one of the things that he says because he talks about this idea that, you know, he struggles and because he struggles, the law cannot help him because you know, he's imperfect according to the law. This is probably one of the most applicable verses I find in my life ever. He says this, For what I am doing I do not understand, and for what I will, do, will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. And even a little more simpler in verse 19, he says, For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, this is the way the New King James puts it, but maybe that's a little wordy for you. Let me break it down in a little more simpler verse, version uh, and, and read this to you. This is a, an, another translation. It says, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. <laughs> I could say that explains a lot of the way that I feel many days. When you struggle with sin, or the impetus of self-control is at the very heart of what you're going to have to do. Just as it does with every other practical aspect of our lives, some inherently sinful and others not. I mean, there are some things that you may struggle with that are not necessarily sinful, like bad habits, right? Chewing your fingernails is not good, but it is not a sin against God, right? You may even say, argue that it's not even not that bad. That's fine. But there are some things that I think that we all could say that are hard for us to have dealing with, or to deal with with self-control. Your temper, right? And that can get you in trouble, sinful. Addiction, that's another one. Self-pleasure, like overeating and drinking. Uh, bad habits, like we've talked about, more than even just the ones of biting your fingernails. And then good habits as well, like not doing the good things that you should do, whether it's normal worldly things like grooming habits or exercise, or maybe it's spiritual disciplines like prayer, you know, devotion, you know, Bible reading, whatever it may be. These things that we think about with self-control, all these things, every single one of them are within our control. And it's important for us to realize it because it is a godly trait. And it's not to be thrown aside as just not that important. In fact, self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit. You sing the song, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? You've heard that? Yeah, remember that verse in Galatians? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. Did you catch that last little bit of that scripture? I love it. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. 
At the heart of our self-control is the idea that we have crucified the flesh. Its passions and desires no longer control us. Christ has given us the power to walk no longer in the way that our bodies tell us to. We don't answer the desires of our body. Our sexuality doesn't control us. Our desire to overindulge doesn't. We aren't to be driven by the next dopamine hit from social media or whatever other addiction we might have. We aren't to be driven even by the things that are necessary for life, such as food and drink. The act of fasting, I think, comes to mind even with this, and it's something that too many people neglect. It's a spiritual discipline, and it's very biblical. And I would quickly you know, talk about this just because I don't want to get into an entire lesson on fasting, but and not the fasting for health either, which is fine and good, but spiritual fasting has many wonderful benefits, one of the chief ones being this idea that we are learning to control ourselves and rely on God. If you can deny yourself this thing, And focus on God. Think about how that empowers you and how easier it will be to do that thing as time goes on. You will strengthen yourself. Hunger is one of the most driving bodily desires that you have. And if you can control that, you can control so much. We've given up uh, on this a lot of times, and I know that we kind of have a a funny word to show the exact opposite of how self-control and hunger controls us. We have this word called hangry. You may have even used this word. It's a combination word of hungry and angry. And, you know, I use this word even sometimes and a lot of times jokingly because it is a real thing. But it's hangry is when you allow your hunger to control your emotion. It's the opposite of self-control is being completely driven by your own desires rather than what you want to do. Nobody wants to walk around being grumpy. Nobody wants to walk around being angry. The need for self-control is even there in such a simple time as that. As we come to a close, I want to say that as Christians, we should be the greatest examples of self-control. Why? Because Christ was the greatest example, and we're his disciples, and we want to be like him. Consider this. Christ's suffering on the cross and leading up to that point is indescribable. And yet his behavior was unlike anything we've ever seen. Acts 8 quotes the prophet Isaiah saying, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. He kept his composure through the entirety of his suffering. 1 Peter 2 and verse 23 says, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. What an example. To trust completely in God and allow that to be a sufficiency. He did not call 10,000 angels. He did not curse those who persecuted him. And he did not fight back. And if Christ did it, we should try to as well. Self-control really matters, especially to the Christian. And we have to train ourselves to use this muscle even harder in a world of comfort and passion of desire. If I have been failing to use this muscle, I should do what I can to make sure I strengthen it and train it each and every day. Study, pray, worship, fast, and rely on God in all my weakness, for without Him I can't do anything. I want to close by saying thank you, and God bless you today. I hope that everything is going well with each and every one of you this week, and i love to see you soon. If you're enjoying these, please check out a lot of the other ones in our worship services as well. Subscribe to the channel if you would like more of these, and you'll be updated each and every time if you click the bell off to the left or right.